Okay, there we go. All right, so I will go ahead and begin. Welcome, everyone. This is Katherine Troutman uh, and Diane Hudson Burns. We're teaching the new SES five-page resume-based application today. This is a 90-minute webinar that will cover how to write the new um, application for government. And uh, we'll be taking questions. The people on line here are um, on mute. So you won't be able to speak out loud, but I'll be looking for your questions and I'll read them to Diane so that we can get them answered for you. Um, I'd like to um, just introduce Diane Hudson Burns. She's the co-author of the book that you see right here on the on this slide. Uh, the book is called The New SES Application, and it's about you know the new five-page SES format rather than the long ten-page traditional format that has been used for many years in government. Diane and I uh, co-authored the book together. The book was started oh ten years ago and uh, the book is based on the handout that we've been using in our two-day class for many many years. So this is a proven um, strategy for writing and teaching and um, I'm personally incredibly thrilled that it's published. It's um, a wonderful resource for anyone who's thinking about ever writing SES five-page resume and needs to write accomplishments based on the five ECQs. So um, we're very, very pleased to have this webinar today. And the PowerPoint is developed from the book. And Diane's going to be uh, begin talking here now. I'll uh, uh, ask a few questions here and there. and. We have two people on the line here, Deepak and Lex. Um, Deepak, if you have any questions along the way, uh, anywhere, just write them in the question box, and I'll pay attention to those and ask Diane. She'll stop once in a while and ask if you have any questions on any part of this application. Diane lives in Boise, Idaho. I am in Baltimore, Maryland. And we work together, and we have for 10 years. So um, this is one of these uh, internet uh, colleague situations we were very communicative. And additionally, we teach a two-day class on how to write this SES package. We'll be teaching one in Baltimore in January, another one in May in Colorado Springs. So if you want to go hands-on and um, have more lecture and writing in a classroom format, you want to, want to consider that. We can send you a web address so that you can look that up later on. So welcome, everyone. Uh, Diane Hudson Burns, thank you so much for teaching this webinar. And I'll just let you begin your curriculum. Thank you. OK, thank you, Catherine. I appreciate that. And I also see some unmute buttons here. I'm going to click them and see if I can unmute the attendees today. And let's try that for a second. Um, Deepak, can you, can you speak and see if I can hear you? No, that's not working. OK. How about Lex? Lex, can you? Yes. Okay. Yeah. But I didn't but I did not okay, Lex, I can hear you. That's great. And Deepak, I cannot hear you though. Oh, you okay. can hear me? Oh, there I can are. hear you now. Oh, okay. Awesome. That's so do great. I have, thank I have, you. I have two other people on the line then you can that you both can speak now. Say something. Everybody say something. We can all hear each other. Okay, let's, great. Let's let's have an introduction from Deepak. Deepak, can you tell us um, a little bit about you and what you would like to learn in this webinar so that Diane and I know what your objectives are for taking the class? He's not, not there? Yeah, I think he's coming in and out. OK. OK, okay. Well, we'll just keep going. But I did unmute them. And so if we have any problems with the sound, then I can mute people back up. So. OK. OK. OK, well, good. Um, again, just welcome to everybody who's on the line with us today. This is our inaugural webinar. And as Catherine said, we do have a two-day actual workshop. And our next one will be in um, January. And we'll talk about that at the end, too. So as we move through our slides here today, and we'll make sure that um, everybody gets a copy of these when we're finished with the class. But the objectives of this here are to provide an overview of the SES application and the Qualifications Review Board. Understanding that is really critical to preparing the whole application and then understanding how and why you're being approved for uh, and certified with your ECQs through the Qualifications Review Board. From there, we're going to talk about the three main types of SES applications. Prior to about two years ago, there was one type. It was the traditional 
resume with all of the executive core qualifications and the technical qualifications, approximately a 20-page application. Today, we also have the five-page resume-based application for SES. And we also have what's called the accomplishments narrative. And we'll take a look at those, and we'll see the differences, and then understand which organizations are accepting which and why, and why you potentially need a couple different types of applications. We're going to talk about the executive federal resume for the GS 13, 14, 15, and equivalent. This is really important to understand that as you are preparing this resume, for the SES, this is um, what we call part of the leadership journey, if you will, working your way up. So as you build on this resume and as you gather your accomplishments for the SES and the executive core qualifications, all this can be applied into resumes that you're preparing even as you're moving up the ladder. And a lot of times we find that clients need to actually prepare a resume at the GS-15 level so that they can get a lateral position, so that they can position themselves in a year or two to actually apply for SES. Uh, for example, I had a client a while back who was an HR specialist for an agency, I think it was Architect of the Capital, and she had approximately 3,000 employees under her uh, guidance, if you will. And she was applying for SES jobs. She actually got the interviews. However, in the interviews, they would say to her, you know, we really like you, but we think you probably need a little bit more experience. So what she did is she lateraled to, I think it was the Department of Transportation, where she had about 100,000 employees underneath her guidance, and, and including contractors. And within about six months, those agencies that she had interviewed then were calling her and saying, hey, we want you back. So sometimes it's just a matter of positioning yourself. We're going to review some of the specialized applications, the senior officer, the senior leader, the candidate development program, and the intelligence agencies, the DOD agencies, and how there's some different specific requirements for each agency that might be different from the one that you're applying for. We're going to talk about the CCAR, which is the Challenge Contact Action Results Format for ECQs, and specifically developing those top 10 accomplishments. Then we're going to also talk about developing the five-page resume. We'll do an analysis of an SES announcement. And then we'll talk about the different application procedures. And then, of course, we'll have Q&A as we move through this process. So we're going to cover quite a bit of things today, but it's, it's very excellent. Also, part of the curriculum for the class that we teach for our two-day webinar is the book, like Catherine was saying on the, the front page of the slide there. And if you would like to order the book after the class, you know, please feel free to let us know. The text pages that you see on these slides are referring to the different chapters and the different sections in the book that we use for that curriculum. So that kind of gives you an idea of what we're looking at here. So that's what I'm talking about here. If you were on page 11 of the new SES application, then you would see that this is the chapter that starts the overview of the SES application process and the qualifications review board. And this slide here on page 20 in the book is in the book. So this is a really excellent slide to help applicants understand how the SES recruitment process works. As you can see here at the top, you create your SES application. And then from there, it is presented to the Agency Executive Resources Board. After the Executive Resources Board reviews it, then and they decide that they, you are a candidate who they would like to interview, then you go through the interview process. Now, the agency also has the power or the rights, if you will, to conduct a second interview, to have you experience some type of additional interview process or testing. For example, I've had a lot of clients recently who have been asked to write an essay after the interview. So after the interview is completed, which is typically a structured, behavior-based interview for SES, then these same candidates are asked to sit in a separate room. They are given a scenario, and they are asked to write an essay, and they have one hour to do that. Now, I've also had clients, instead of actually having to sit there in that office and write the essay, some of them send the essay materials home. 
And so one gal who recently received three offers for SES after I wrote her package, which was really exciting this past summer, um, she was asked to write an essay. And she was given by the, the HR uh, people in the agency, she was given about 20 links and PDFs to press releases and reports from that agency. And then she was asked to summarize all that into a two-page essay. So it was quite an experience to go through all that. Um, but my point is that the agency can have you engaged in any type of additional testing, if you will, that they want to. So be prepared for those kind of things. From there, your application package then goes to the Qualifications Review Board. Now, the Qualifications Review Board is an OPM process. So an agency that's not under OPM guidelines does not have to go through that same process. The Qualifications Review Board will certify or not certify the executive core qualifications as they see fit. So the Agency Executive Resources Board is actually going to be looking at the entire application package, the resume, the technical qualifications, which are directly related to the position, and the executive core qualifications, which are leading change, leading people, results-driven, business acumen, and building coalitions. And we're going to go through those in a couple minutes. And in addition to any, like I said, they can check references. They can have a different test. Then when it gets to the qualifications review board level, they're strictly looking for the executive core qualifications. They're focusing on the 28 leadership competencies that OPM has designated are required for an SES to have in order to be successful in an SES level position. Now, here's the catch. With the new five-page resume, that does not include those 10 pages of essays from the executive core qualifications. So in the five-page resume, those ECQs are all rolled into that five-page resume as part of the text of the resume. So the Qualifications Review Board at this point in time can actually review the resume, review the reference list, and review any additional comments from the interview process. So the interview process now becomes part of what they're looking at to determine does this person have those 28 leadership competencies and can we certify them. If you are not approved, or in, in you're disapproved that first round, then your application will be sent back to this level here. Muted.
Unmuted. Can you hear me? Can people hear me now? Hello? Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm okay. I'm not sure. Okay, I'll keep going and see what happens. Okay, bye. Apologize, everybody, for the technical difficulty. So hopefully, um, Lex said he could hear me. So, and Catherine, can you hear me? And I can't hear her. So I don't see your name on the list either. So, okay, so we'll keep going with the leadership journey. Um, as I was saying, you can see that as you move through the, the, the different levels, you have the team manager, project manager, you move up to supervisor, manager, and executive. And that you can see that the technical um, qualifications or the leadership competencies fall under external awareness, vision, strategic thinking, entrepreneurship, resilience, and decisiveness. And so this is really an exciting thing as you are preparing a resume for the other level. So the GS 12, 13, 14, 15 levels and you began to use the different competencies in your leadership accomplishments as you move up the leadership journey. So this is something that's really wonderful to remember as you're building your resume for the future. Okay, the different application formats, um, and I, you know, I was just going to say too, Lex or Catherine or whoever, oh, okay, Catherine just sent me a note saying we can hear you now, thanks everybody. Okay. Um, She's in the class. So yeah, just people send me little notes and I'll try and pay attention to that if this happens again. So different, app, different SES application formats. The three most common SES application formats are the traditional SES applications, the five-page resume-based format, and the accomplishment record. So we're, let's take a look at what these look like specifically. And if you have a copy of the book, you would see on page 69, that the traditional executive application is four to five pages of the resume. Then you have the executive core qualification statement, which are approximately 10 pages. There are two pages for each executive core qualification, and there are five of those. Then you have the technical and managerial factors, which are one page each, uh, typically. And then you have the cover letter if it's required or if it's requested. So the technical managerial factors are specifically related to the position that you're applying for. So they're not necessarily specific to the ECQs, but they're specific to the position. And, and we'll take a look at that when we go out uh, onto the web in a little bit and see if we can find the position description. So you can see that this entire package here runs approximately, it can be 
15 to 20, sometimes 25 pages, depending upon how many technical qualifications there are. And in some cases, there can be, um, I've seen upwards of 10, um, you know, 8 to 10. I've even seen 14 technical qualifications for applications. And some applications require additional types of essays. And so then it gets a little bit even more complicated. Or if you're in a medical field or scientific or statistical field, sometimes you need a CV. And that can get really long. So just be prepared for that kind of thing. The executive federal resume for the GS 14, 13, 14, 15, and then this would also be true for the SES level executive resume that you would submit with that traditional executive application package. This is a four to five pages typically, or around 20,000 characters if it's in the USA Jobs, uh, if you're going to submit it into USA Jobs. And so 20,000 characters makes a, a good, decent resume, and that's about five pages. The new USA Jobs is now allowing us to put 5,000 characters per each job description. So this is kind of exciting, because then it allows you to have um, more content for each position description. And, and that's really good if your current job is really pertinent to what you're trying to get into. Typically, these resumes are posted on USA Jobs, AVU, or other individual federal websites. So this is a, a good thing to know. And then sometimes they may include KSAs or responses that validate requirements specified in specific self-assessment questions. So one of the things that's really important is if you find a position out there on the web that um, you are interested in, one of the very first things that you want to do is skim through it and click down and find where it says um, self-assessment questions or look at questions here and click that link and see if you can find one. Um, Kath, Catherine, can I, I'm going to change over the presenter to you, if you can hear me. Can you um, find us an announcement with self-assessment questions? Sure, I can do that. Um, can you hear me talk now? I can hear you now, yes. Okay, hey, wonderful. Yeah, so me, you can do that. You can turn over the uh, over to you. to me. Uh, let me see if I can click it over to you. I clicked on show my screen, so I think maybe you can see my screen now. OK, there we go. All right, there we go. OK, I am so glad to be back here. Um, so I'm going to click on uh, Senior Executives on the home page. And we're very lucky that it's working right now. Yes. And I'll, I'll just look for uh, the keyword, let's do director, so we can get a lot of different positions up. And uh, what are we looking for, Diane? I want to find a position that has self-assessment questions so they can see where the link is for that. OK. Let's look at the director, uh, Deputy Director Office of Security for Commerce. And let's scroll down to uh, qualifications. And those are the ECQs. Let's just look real quick and see if this is a uh, long version or a short version. I'm always curious. Aren't you curious, Diane, when you first look at an announcement, you want to know which, which format do they want, right? Absolutely. <laughs> That's the first thing we look for. I know. It says right here, applicants are required to submit a narrative statement for each of the five TQs and ECQs. All right. Well, and it says, do not enter. Refer to your resume. <laughs> I think they mean it. This is handled by Ruthie Stewart. OK, questions, questionnaire. Oh, here we go. To preview the questions, click here. And let's see what they what this looks like. Oh, it's easy. 8,000 characters. So there will be a questionnaire. Now, this is a monster.com application questionnaire. It's not um, application manager. And they want 8,000 characters for each one of these. So this is, this is a writing project right here. The, the PTQ is um, Knowledge of Anti-Terrorism, Counter-Espionage. What did you see was this again? This is Commerce? Hmm. That's interesting. Commerce. It's oh, Office of Secretary. Oh, OK. Oh, it's in the Office of Security. Let's, let me look for one more, Diane, uh, that's not a monster. Let's find one that's Application Manager, okay. which is the USA Jobs um, staffing one. Let's, oh, the US, oh, the Office of Personnel Management. Here you go. Deputy Associate Director of Operations. 
boy, whoever gets that job is going to be sorry. But that's OK. <laughs> <laughs> They're just having a bad week. All right, qualifications and evaluations, let's look. There's, um, here's the TQ. Uh, large distributed workforce in the government. And these, this is a desirable TQ. Uh, supervision of investigative programs. So now let's see if there is a uh, questionnaire format for this. And you never know where to find these. There it is, view occupational questionnaire. And uh, let's let's look at this to see. I think it's just the traditional questions. Oh, look. It's just the, oh, well, wow, look. Here we go. This one is the five-pager. To meet minimum quals for this position, you must show in your resume the five ECQs and the TQ. Do not submit separate statements. So there you go. Okay. This is the new version right here by OPM. Oh, let's so see where it OPM says this. using the new version. Okay. Yeah. I guess OPM is uh, complying with their own rules. That's kind of a good thing. Um, it says right here, ECQs are required for entry to SES to meet the minimum quals you have to show in your resume. Look at that. Mm -hmm. So the, there's really no questionnaire with this one except for those um, technical questions that they were asking there. So this one is a five-pager. And, you know, it's kind of hard, uh, Diane. Uh, how do you handle it when you work with a client who comes to you and wants one version and then they come up with another announcement and needs another version. How, how do you deal with that, Diane? Well, when we have, if we have the traditional ECQs already prepared, then it's a little bit easier because we can summarize those into the shorter bullets, which I have slides for in a few minutes that we'll look at. Um, if they already have a five-page resume and now they need a full-blown essay package, then it's a little bit more intense because now we have to develop those stories into 10 pages of essays. So yeah. we kind of have to go back to the, the drawing board. But I recommend that everybody starts with their top 10 list of accomplishments and builds out those essays, even if they're not in, in perfect format. So even if they're just kind yeah. of bulleted lists. But that, that way, they're prepared to create either type of application as necessary. So that's this one, I, 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 open, I open up a third one. And this is one of the traditional formats here. Each PTQ and ECQ has to be addressed in a separate statement. And yeah. they need to be one to two pages for each. So this is right. one of those um, traditional Which formats. What Let's see with this questionnaire. Yeah. Each agency can choose their own method, whatever they feel like uh, asking for. And it's a little hard for SE applicants because Really, they should do what you just said, which is create the long version. And then they're prepared for either. And uh, right. oh, this you, is another one of those monsters. OK. So there three TQs and then uh, one, two, three, four TQs, it looks like? Uh, no, only three. Two. Seven, eight, and nine are TQs right here. Oh, yeah, you're right. So, so there's three, three TQs, 8,000 characters each. So. That's about a page and a half or two pages. So we have eight times three, not eight times nine is uh, 32 pages. Oh, really? Did you read that much? No, no, no. It's 10 plus three. One, two, oh, three. So 16. Thir thir 13 to 16 pages for that. Yeah. And then plus resume, five pages. So okay. you're looking at 20 to 21 pages, approximately. Catherine, yeah. would you look up a GS-15 position and one with self-assessment questions so we can see how the questions vary um, okay. compared to the, the SES positions? Deepak has a question, though. He says, "Is this version in this version, are professional technical qualifications part of the five pages? I think he's asking about the last announcement, the OPM one. So he wants to know if the tech quals are included in the five pages along with the ECQs. Yes. Okay. Yeah. This is, and we're gonna we're gonna talk about this a little bit more after we look at some of this stuff here. We're gonna talk about it more in more in depth so that you understand it. And if you have follow up questions, please let me know because this is where it gets a little bit tricky. The five page resume basically is taking that original twenty page entire document of essays, resume, ECQs, and TQs, and then boiling it down into five pages. So where you see where where the mandatory technical quals that Catherine has on the board right this minute 
demonstrate experience conducting and supervising investigative background, criminal, et cetera, operations, you absolutely want to make certain that you have addressed that in your resume. Now, having said that, it may be that one of your bullets that you're using for um, this is supervising investigative background operations. It might be that leading people in your original essays might cover the response to that. So it might be that the bullet in your resume really is going to be, when you identify it, it might say leading people slash desirable technical qualification one. We would just say DQ1. So you're covering two issues at the same time. You're covering the leading people, which is an ECQ, and you're covering a desirable technical qual. Or the one above it is executive level experience managing a large distributed workforce in a government or corporate entity. So that might fall under business acumen, or it might fall under leading change. It depends on how your story goes. So that might cover you know, two stones at one time, but you definitely want to make sure that the technical quals are covered in the five-page resume. Now here's the other catch. If you just apply for this position right here and you use those two technical quals that we just saw and you suddenly apply for a different position next week and the technical qualifications are completely different, you're going to have to have a different version of your five-page resume now. So now your five-page resume is going to have to make sure that you cover the responses for the technical quals for the new position. So let's say, for example, if you apply for a 500 series position, which is uh, accounting, finance, accounting, and you also are an expert in administrative management, which would be your 300 series. And so one day you're applying for the 500 series and there's a question specific to accounting and budget or uh, auditing or something like that. And then the next week you apply for a 300 series it's really not focused on budgeting or auditing, but it's really focused more on office administration and um, operations of personnel, then you might want to take those budgeting, auditing responses out of your resume and replace them with something specific for the 300 series. So if, if that doesn't make sense, let us know and we'll continue to answer your question. This, this announcement, uh, look at this, Diane, it says, um, this is a little different. Um, it says the ECQ should be limited to one page per ECQ. That's refreshing, don't you think? Mm, I've seen a number mm. of those. That's, that's something that yeah. you have to be very careful is to yeah. look at the announcements from top to bottom, review them in depth, and make yeah. absolutely certain that you know all the requirements. Right. Because if you had a two-page ECQ, and you turned it in for this one, they're only going to read the first page, or they might even disqualify you. I like this instruction here, too, Diane, where it says that your responses must demonstrate that you have possession of these qualifications through education and everything. Please provide examples that are clear, concise, and emphasize the level of your experience, scope, and complexity. I like that language. That's good. So they're telling yeah. you exactly what they want when, when you write your ECQs. So very specific and mm -hmm. when you see it like that basically they're saying everything that you say that you can do has to be justified in your package. Right. So you can't just answer a self-assessment question and say yes I've supervised 50 people but then somewhere in your resume it didn't say I supervised 50 people and how and when and where and why. And You can't just say I supervised 50 people. You have to say you know within this organization I had oversight leadership for 50 personnel in X number of geographically separated offices across the nation. You know, so you want to actually give the scope of it, not just I supervise 50 people. Well, wow, look at that one, four big TQs on there, MTQ. And they have to be separate, not only one page each, though. That's good. It's not 8,000 characters. One page is more like 5,000 or 4,000 characters, so that's a break. I can't stand that 8,000 field request because it's so long. I can see it for the ECQs, but I think for each of the TQs, it, I don't see why it has to be so long. But um, in, here, in this case with these TQs, they told you right up here that they want specific examples. So the best way to write those TQs as well as ECQs is to um, give examples of these four um, the, the TQs that are here. Oh, look, you're going to do your resume online. Oh, you must enter your resume online or you will not be considered. Oh, 
<laughs> we better do it online. There's no way of sending this package in any other way. Or you will not be considered. Lots of the SES applications, do you see this, Diane, that you can yes. send them in by email or mail? Mm-hmm. Yeah, not this one. Yeah. You have to pay a lot of attention, and, and we have a slide on that, too. You have to pay a lot of attention of how you're going to apply for these positions. So that's mm -hmm. why it's just really important. I always start right at the top. The first thing I look for is the agency, then I look for the closing date. Because if it's going to close tomorrow, then there might not be time to apply unless you have your application already prepared. Then I scroll down, and I skip through stuff like what are my benefits, but I scroll down to find out how do you apply, and what kind of application do you need to apply for this position. Yeah, and then if it's you know if it's four TQs and and a full application of ECQs, you need a couple two or three weeks to put your application together unless it's already prepared and you can just maybe tweak your TQs, but you can't. It's it, it's tough to apply for a position if it closes on you know next Monday and you just saw it today. So those are the things that you want to look for real quickly. Um, you know, are you eligible to apply? And then if so, when does it close? And what are the requirements for the position? Mm -hmm. Diane, would you like me to apply for this job right now? Oh, I can. gosh, that would be great. I can. I can apply for it. I, I, won't, I won't apply for it perfectly, but I can do this right this minute. This is what um, Catherine and I do all day long, and, and the resume place staff. We apply for positions. I've applied for every SES position that's been available in the last couple years, probably. Now, I always am, I'm always honest. I always say, no, I'm not qualified, and no, you know, I'm, I click those buttons. However, um, and if I can avoid actually clicking the, the apply button, I do. But this is the way that you actually get into the application to make sure that you're not missing anything. I had a client apply for a position a couple weeks ago with the IRS, and four TSAs showed up just before you were finished with the application. And the person was applying at 11.30 p.m. at night, which is, is not good. So now this took you over to... This is, uh, they're asking for my oh, social security number, and they said they were going to stop doing that. Oh, okay, well, well this you is, never know. This is, this is the monster application. Yeah, so the monster she application. She clicked, she clicked from USA Jobs, and then now it's traversing her over to where she's going to actually finish applying for the position. So USA Jobs is kind of a stopping point for where your resume is, is sitting. And then you can also USA Jobs to track your progress. But in order to actually apply for positions, you have to click on the resume you want to use, and then you have to move over to these other um, online applications to finish your application. Yeah, and they asked for my social security number and my birth date, which they both said they were going to stop doing when um, they moved to the new USA Jobs, but you can't pay any attention to that kind of information. So I'm, I'm here in uh, monster.com, and as you can see, I'm struggling to figure out how to apply for this job because it doesn't seem to be working very well. But um, So I've got my personal information in there. Um, I don't need any veterans information. Um, documents is not asking me for anything. This announcement is a problem, everybody, uh, because I can't apply for this job. It's not working. So I can't okay. apply for this job. Um, it's, it's interesting to see, though, how I could not apply for it because now um, I know I can't apply for it. So I would go back and call Keisha Nelson. And I see that it's open until November 17. It says right here um, in, in words that I have to apply online. And I can't apply online because I just tried. Mm -hmm. So it, um, uh, Deepak, if you run into this problem of trying to apply online, do it ahead of time because right now I can't apply right now. So it's not working right. You're going to find that with the new USA Jobs 3.0 problems for applying with various federal positions. So. Um, Diane, if you want to go back to the PowerPoint, you can. And then in a little bit, I can try to apply for another job if you want. OK. I can try now, again. That was not working. OK. You I'm not giving now? feedback. <laughs> nice try. <laughs> I don't feel like giving you feedback right now. They don't need any more feedback. Are you kidding? They have too many. Let's, let's type the word policy in here. Well, and for the people on the line, too, so that, I mean, uh, I'm assuming everybody's familiar, but perhaps not. Um, a lot of 
uh, positions right now that with USA Jobs just going through a transition to the 3.0 just about two weeks ago, a lot of people can't get into their their accounts. Um, the system is down. It's locked up. Um, they have reposted positions or allowed positions to be posted for an additional three weeks. So there's a lot of problems happening with the system right now. So just be aware of that. Um, if you are applying for positions anytime soon, make sure that you are not waiting up until the last minute to put an application in online. You know, play with it as much as you can until you get it in or call the point of contact if you're still having trouble with it. Well, in this case, I just applied, tried to apply for another job as a substance abuse director, and um, I can't apply for this one either because it's telling me now that I have a duplicate Social Security number um, in my account, which I don't. So now I'm going to have to figure this out. <laughs> I could probably do this all day and not apply for a job. <laughs> wow. This is pretty interesting, isn't it? So again, I'd go back to the HR person, the name on the agency page, and um, try to talk to that person and, and see if I can um, apply for it, maybe by email, since uh, this is not going to work. And by the way, you, if you're on Application Manager, you cannot go back to USA Jobs. You have to go back manually. They did not fix the back button, Diane. When you go to Application Manager, you can't go back to USA Jobs, even though they're mm -hmm. owned and run by the same organization. So, so anyway, okay. I tried two times. I couldn't do it. So I would call both of those HR people and say, I have my package ready to go. Can I just email it to you? And that's what I would do, for, at least for now, while they're working on the system. Looks like there's problems with integration between USA Jobs and Application Manager and Monster um, accepting applications. But hopefully in a few weeks, it'll all get fixed up. So. Mm -hmm. That would so be our... Go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, do you have to switch me over, or is it going to come oh. up? Let me check. I have it up, but I don't have the, yeah, you have to switch me over. Right. So click the Change Presenter button up there. Okay. I clicked it. There you go. Did the screen come up there where you accept it? No. I clicked it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Can you get it back? No, let me see. Let me see. I'm trying to show my screen. Okay, let me see. Is this going to work? Okay, can you see my screen now? I can. Okay. Hopefully yeah, everybody else can. Lex sent I me a note saying he couldn't hear me. Lex, can you hear me now? Anybody not being able to hear me? Okay, hopefully everybody can hear me. It's really hard to know when. Uh, I can, can hear, hear you. Okay. Okay, so wanted to take a look at just for a couple seconds. Some, you know, Catherine was just going through all those applications right there, um, but some of the positions that you might look, find that are senior executive positions. Um, are a little bit different, so they're not under the guise of OPM necessarily, and that would be your senior officer, your senior leader. Now, your candidate development program, most most of that that program is under OPM, but there are other leadership programs that may not be under OPM. And then there's the intelligence field, the FAA, and DOD, and others. These organizations have their own requirements, so some of them use some versions of the ECQs, some of them have created their own UCQs or their own technical qualifications that are more specific or specified. The FAA calls their quote unquote ECQs dimensions. Um, they're all similar, but they have different requirements. So the reason for this slide is simply for you to be aware so that if you're applying for something in a different agency and you see something a little different, you're not going, well, why isn't it the whole ECQ package? Or why do I have to write something different in this case? So this just keeps you aware that there are different requirements out there and you want to pay attention to that as you're applying for these positions. So getting ready to write your, um, your ECQs and your federal resume really includes specifically putting together a list of your top 10 accomplishments, creating those accomplishments in the CCAR format, and then mapping those accomplishments. So we recommend at the Resume Place that you put together a list of your top 10 accomplishments. 
So really think hard about more recent accomplishments. You know, we always kind of tease a little bit, but OPM's looking for accomplishments that are within the, the past 10 years. So if it's prior to 10 years, then we always say, you know, if you walked on the moon, that's probably a pretty good accomplishment. But if it's not that, then OPM's pretty much going to kick you out if you haven't identified accomplishments within the most recent 10 years. And the reason for that is kind of twofold. Number one is if it's an accomplishment 20 years ago, then the question would be, were you really an executive? And in some cases you are, because you might have been 45 or 50 years old and you're still working, and so you were. The second reason is if it's an older accomplishment, then it's not as current with what's happening in Congress today and what's happening in, you know, with the current administration and where all the changes are happening in government. So if you can develop more than 10, I recommend that highly. And the reason for that is because if you have to use two examples for your ECQs, your set of ECQs, there's two examples for each one, so that comes out to 10, and then you have an additional three or four technical qualifications, you might need 13, 14, 15, 16 stories. So, you know, create your top 20 if you can. And then you want to further develop that list into the CCAR format, and we'll take a look at that right here. The CCAR format is the challenge, the context, the action, and the results. And so, very specifically, you want to describe a specific problem or a goal. You know, what, what, what's the challenge that you encountered? And then what's the context around that? Who are the individuals, the group that you worked with, the environment or the culture that you were in, and then what did you have to do to tackle that particular challenge that you described? When you're writing the five-page resume, this context becomes the scope of your leadership duties. And so now when you're writing your little bullets, instead of those big, full, long essays, you can take the context out of those bullets and just stick with the challenge and the action and the results. And we'll see an example of that in a couple minutes. Then you want to write your actions, which are you know, discussing the specific actions that you took to address the challenges described. So how many actions were there? One, two, three, four. And then the results. You need specific examples of the results of your actions in addressing the challenge. So the accomplishments demonstrate the quality and the effectiveness of your leadership skills. And you want to use percentages. You want to qualify. You want to use dollar figures. You want to quantify. You want to use um, numbers to the best of your ability. I always say, if you can compare what it was like before you created the result and what it's like after, you probably have your result answer. So how bad was it before? If customer service was bad, how bad? Can you quantify that somehow? Look at the customer service surveys, and then look at the customer service surveys after you've implemented the new program. So that's Diane, one way to really... When you're working with uh, your clients and working on the CCAR uh, format, what part of the CCAR is the most challenging for executives to write when they're writing their top 10 list? Oh, <laughs> couple, it depends on who I'm working with. A couple places. I think challenge is hard for a lot of people because they just leave it out. Mm -hmm. And even though that's at the top of the list, they'll just kind of leave it out. Um, and I think the results, it's interesting. I'll read the essays, and then the result will be one line. And it yeah. will just say, you know, I made a difference in the organization, or morale improved. And again, I go back to, well, tell me why morale improved, and then tell me how that was applicable to the whole organization and mm -hmm. increasing the performance of the organization. And every once in a while, I'll see somebody miss action, and they just leave yeah. out the action. They just write about the context and leave out what they really did. Mm -hmm. I was looking at a, a, an executive resume myself today, and, and uh, every sentence started with provide. <laughs> OK. <laughs> provide. Diane, what does provide mean to you when you see an executive uses a verb of provide. What does that mean? Well, it, it means that you, you, you gave them something. Um, yeah, right, something. Yeah, right. Yeah, something. something. There's a lot more powerful leadership words that we can use. Um, right. you, know, that you, ha you know, take out the provide and just turn it right into manage, led, organized, coordinated, elevated. You know, really use your leadership terms and take out the provided. Yeah, every so. sentence he had led with provide, and that mm -hmm. he's a consultant, so he's writing about his projects, and he wasn't really writing about what he did. He was writing about what 
I don't know, I guess what he oversaw, but uh, he, he has to go into, in his case, his real problem was actions. Oh, actually, in his case, it was all a problem. There was, there was a, no challenge at all, and there was no results, and the actions were about providing something. So I guess what he did right was the context and then left the rest out. So um, they were, uh, he, had, he had at least 10 uh, projects in the resume without the, the full details. And Diane, why does the, um, the QRB or the OPM Executive Review Board, why do they want to see examples in this much detail in the CCAR format? Well, the, the QRB and the OPM have, have decided that this format makes it easy for them to read. It makes it clear for them to see what the challenge was, what the context of the situation was, what the actions were, and what the results were. So if they don't see the whole story, it's, it's an essay. It's, you know, it's the introduction, it's the body, and it's the end, the conclusion. So if they don't see the results and they don't see how you came to the results, then they may not be able to see that, that executive leadership. And that's what and they're looking for. Are you able to write a CCAR in the five-page SES resume? Is there enough space to, to cover all elements of an accomplishment in that format? There is. If you use a, if you use a thousand word um, um, mini bullet, there is. And we'll, we'll show you one in a couple minutes here on a slide. But a lot of times, like I said, the, the context comes out of it. So you really mostly just have the challenge, the action, the results for the five-page resume simply because the context is now integrated into the resume under your job title. So the context kind of comes out and you stick with the challenge action results. But it is possible to create a very short, you know, six-line, eight-line bullet that has the entire CCAR model. Absolutely. But that's I, tight writing. That's tight writing. I have a favorite accomplishment from uh, one of our Navy um, annex you know, Navy Yard uh, examples with the Navy Leadership Program. This is an engineer. And um, go back over up to the CCAR, because I just want to tell a quick version of the story. Um, the challenge was that um, the Australian Navy SEALs, their elite SEALs, had lost a submersible in the ocean at, off the coast of Australia. And they lost one of their um, elite SEAL team members, and Australian Navy has never lost any of their SEAL team members that they never brought back to, um, to the country. So um, it was very deep in the ocean, and Australian Navy was unable to get it. So um, uh, the challenge was that they contacted Japan and Guam and Korea and tried to get help from their navies to pull up the submersible, and they couldn't get any help over there. So they contacted the US Navy and this particular engineering department at the Navy Yard. And this engineer that I interviewed was um, took on the challenge of pulling up the submersible. And the actions that he took were that he um, contracted for one of the largest cranes that he could find um, in Asia. And he had it shipped to Australia and then contracted for um, very large um, um, uh, wharfs um, uh, where, where he could put the tie together some um, barges to put the crane on. And he took the barge out to the sea where the submersible was um, supposedly uh, down there because they were able to find it with a submarine and a ship. And they lowered the, the, um, the crane to pick up the submersible. And he was able to, with his engineering techniques and, and all the t tools and techniques and knowledge that he had, was able to pull up the submersible. And the results were that he was able to bring the submersible back up and return the seal member to the family and to the country so that he could be um, recognized for his heroism and work. And the Australian Army was very pleased with uh, the Navy and, and cooperating in uh, saving this, this, um, this recognition for the Australian Navy. Now that's a CCAR. The challenge, the context, the action, and the results, and it's a story. And it's very memorable. I'm, I'll never forget it. <laughs> I can just imagine the crane on the barges out there in the ocean picking up this, the submersible. And uh, it's a very visual accomplishment, and it's a sea car. So um, that's basically what the sea car is, is storytelling and giving all the elements of the accomplishment. So there. So there. That would be, let's see, that's results driven. Yeah, most likely. Because yeah. it's not changed. Well, it could be changed. Maybe they never did it before. Could be changed, but results driven was that he he was a, a going for those customer service accountability and um, whatever all the competency is. So I think results driven. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we're going to look at those real quick here. So, um, so ECQs 
are the executive level KSAs, if you will, and they're in, uh, complex because they do reflect the 28 leadership competencies. And so within that, that either 20-page package or that five-page resume, all 28 leadership competencies need to be relevant in combination with your structured interview for a five-page resume. But like I said, the executive, um, and the qualifications review board, it's pretty simple for them to identify, do you have these leadership competencies or not? So, And as we talked about, the ECQs are leading change, leading people, results-driven, business acumen, uh, and building coalitions. And what you can see here is the specifics of each of these, and I'm not, I'm not going to go into this, but you can look at this and you can also look at OPM's SES guide and it will give you a complete breakdown of what they're looking for under each of these. So for example, for leading people, one of the things that is going to be really important is the um, constructive resolution of conflicts. If you don't have a bullet somewhere in your resume package, either in the five-page resume or in the full essay package, talking about resolving conflict, then your resume is probably going to get kicked back. So there's certain things that you have to remember that have to be covered. Business acumen is what I call a three-prong ECQ. It's managing human, financial, and information resources. So those three prongs have to be touched on in each of the application packages. The fundamental competencies are the cross-cutting competencies that OPM has said that, you know, if, remember we looked at that leadership journey, if you go back to that, basically this is what you have to have in order to even move up the ladder. So you have to have good interpersonal skills, you have to have good oral communication, integrity and honesty, written communication, continual learning and public service motivation. If you don't have this as a foundation and a basis, then it's going to make it difficult for you to move up to the SES level. So you don't actually have to write a bullet that says, I'm an excellent um, oral communicator, but you have to be able to say, maybe under building coalitions, you're going to give an example of being a good communicator orally in writing because you're going to talk about you did or presented a high-level briefing before maybe a foreign delegation of some kind, and then you completed the written report. So right there, that covers those competencies. So let's talk about building these narratives a little bit so that you can see how we get into the short bullets for the five-page resume. Um, overview, you have two executive leadership examples per ECQ. You're focusing on executive leadership, not the technical abilities, because that would be for your technical qualifications. You want to keep examples fairly recent within the last five to ten years. Use specific examples, not generalities. OPM does not want to hear about what you think about something or what your philosophies are or how you would manage or lead something. They want to know, give us an example using that CCAR format. You need to show personal leadership and not participation, and this is where you have to change all your we's to I's. It's usually about 2,000, or excuse me, two pages or 8,000 characters, and like we said earlier, the 10 pages. One of the things that's important is to avoid those generalities. So if you say, I manage a staff of 18 supporting policy development, it doesn't tell me a whole lot. But if you say, I lead an office with 18 senior interagency personnel, that's significant interagency personnel, detailed from six different agencies, guide staff in policy development and planning to improve the sharing and dissemination of information across the government for national security. Now this is just an example of the differences between generalities and vague references. But if you added a result to that section where it says clarify right there, you would have a seat car. So think about that. Because there's a challenge in there. You've got 18 different people coming from six different agencies. That's a bit of a challenge right there. Everyone's got a different perspective. And then this is the context. You're guiding the staff in policy development and planning. Um, and, and this is what the person did. And then if you were just to add a result there, you'd have a little C card going. OK. Also, you want to show measurable results, especially in terms of improved customer service, increased efficiency, productivity, money saved. You want to qualify and quantify all of your accomplishments. You really want to give the reader a simple, hey, here's the results, and show a lot of diversity in your accomplishments. So you don't want to be using the same story over and over. Even though it might have been your biggest story, and it might have been your biggest challenge, and it might have been your biggest project or program, Somehow you have to break that down into different components so 
so that you can use it for leading people, a results-driven and a leading change, but not use the same exact story with the same wording each time. Again, you want to focus on recent experience, education, and training. So if you had a recent master's degree, if you had a recent certification, something that's really applicable, you want to get that in your five-page resume. So you want to squeeze a lot of information into a small amount of space. By the way, the five-page resume is typically one-inch margins, Times New Roman, or Arial font in, in 12 points. So be aware of that. You can't just go, well, I'm going to squeeze it down to nine-point font so I can get more information on the page, and I'm going to make my margin down to 0.5. They're not going to accept that. So be really careful. Follow the rules. Um, you can review each ECQ and assess them according to relevance, clarity, detail, objectiveness, and effectiveness. So, you know, have a friend, a colleague, or a family member who understands, you know, executive leadership and have them review it for you before you turn it in. And then, of course, draftsmanship is going to be extremely important. No typographical errors, and you definitely want to use executive level writing. So, I had a client one time who started his resume with assisted the senior director with, and I said, assisted? And he said, well, you know, this guy works directly for the president, so it's pretty high-level stuff. And I said, well, okay, but assisted is a typical word that we might see with clerical staff. So we have to turn this into, uh, you know, worked directly with someone who worked directly with the president. So somehow we had to change all that language. So kind of be careful with that. ECQ inspiration, you know, really look at these examples that you use, reflects innovation, describes your talent. A lot of people, and Catherine would agree with me, I think, when we sit in these classes, people would say, I just don't know how to brag on myself. But this is one place where you get to do that. You get to brag on yourself. So you get to talk about your talent, your gifts, and your abilities. Um, you want to match other examples. So if your resume says that you supervise you know, 50 people and your ECQs don't talk about it, or vice versa, then you've got to disconnect someplace. So you want to make sure that everything matches up. You want to amplify your explanation of the challenges that you faced. So definitely make sure that you have that full CCAR format. You want to present the specifics of your solution. So don't just say that I improve morale, but what are the specifics of that? Give me the, the sub-results of that. You know, just keep giving me the ripple effect, because if you improve morale within your organization, was the program that you created to improve morale used as a model someplace else? So really think about that. Explore what distinguishes you. So one of the things I always ask all of my coaching clients, I say, what makes you different from the other people that are going to be interviewed for that position? Why should I hire you? So really think about that. And they use objective instead of subjective descriptors. Again, they really don't want to hear about what you think about things. They want to know what you can accomplish for them. Once you've put all of your, your little CCAR stories into um, your, the, the CCAR format for all of the ECQs, then you want to map them. You want to look at the specific 28 leadership competencies that fall underneath leading change, leading people, results-driven business acumen, and building coalition. And then you want to decide, where do my stories fit best? Is it a leading change story, leading people story, building coalition story? So then you want to begin to really map it. One of the things that's important about mapping is if you map it now and you decide a little later, you know what, I really think building coalitions is really probably more a leading people story, that's OK. You can switch them around or you can change the focus of it. It doesn't have to be exact the first time around. And a lot of times we flip-flop ECQs and technical calls at the last minute based on how the story is unfolding in the end. So you can identify it one way in the beginning, but it might be something different before it's all over with. OK, so Diane, let's talk about the five you. page. I'm sorry? Diane, when you're, when you're um, uh, working with clients and they have their top 10 list of accomplishments, which one of the five ECQs seems to be the easiest for people to write? Uh, I think results-driven is usually the easiest one, because most uh -huh. people at that level have accomplishments and they have projects that they've worked on. Mm -hmm. okay. So usually results-driven flows pretty easily. 
I think pieces of business acumen flow pretty easily because most people have either had budgeting or contracting or financial management or HR management, but maybe not all of them. So that becomes a glitch sometimes. Leading change is typically the most, the most difficult for most people because they have to identify why they led the change and how they led the change. So a lot of times people will misinterpret um, leading change with results driven. So it was really more of a program that was implemented as opposed to how did I lead the program to change the entire environment, the culture change, the mindset change. So leading change is a little bit more, more challenging. <clears throat> how about you? What do you find? I think um, the one that is the hardest for current federal employees seems to be business acumen. They, they don't think of themselves as business people, and I have to remind them that contracting and budgets are business, and also as part of business acumen, information technology is part of it, or information management. And a lot of senior executives do have um, leadership opportunities to improve information management. So um, business acumen requires a little bit of coaching for executives, but they usually can um, develop it. Oh, another part of business acumen is workforce planning and human resources. And of course, the manager in government does have to adjust their staffing and their workforce and, and the performance management of their people. So once I start talking about business acumen and, and in terms of the, the uh, managing finances and the budget, contracts, working people around, especially now that there's there's buyouts and there's rifts and there's, you know, so much reduction, like Air Force is, is going to go for every three people reduced, they're going to hire one. So a senior manager in Air Force is going to be juggling people like crazy. That will be business acumen and they're doing it because of budget. And then, of course, they'll probably have to improve information management because they'll have to do more with less people. So I, I personally love business acumen because I am a business executive myself, but a lot of government managers find that one to be the most challenging to write. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. And, and I think that every, every executive has, you know, some area of weakness where they say, well, I'm not sure I'm 100% on, you know, conflict management or, you know, whatever it might be. And sometimes we have to look at that and then really talk and probe and ask a lot of questions to see if we can figure out a way to fix that or do they need to get into a detailed assignment for a period of time so that they can pick up those competencies. So mm -hmm. it just depends. Um, so let's see if we can talk about the five-page resume-based bullets here for just a couple minutes. I want to. I put up a couple bullets here so that you can see what goes into this five-page resume. Basically, this is a bullet for leading change. When you put your five-page resume together, you don't use the identifiers at the end, but we put them in so that you can see them. And on page 147 in our book, too, we have case studies in here, and you can see the five-page resume, um, before resumes, after resumes, and some of the um, ECQs that are also throughout the book. So we have some really nice case studies in here. But you can see how some of these bullets are a little bit longer than you know a typical bullet in a resume, because a typical resume by, might be two to three to four lines, maybe. And this gets a little bit longer. But basically, this came from a two-page essay. And this was boiled down into just, I don't know, what is that, 12 or 13 lines, something like that. So it's less than 1,000 characters. So this is what you want to do and figure out and pare down from your big, long essay. And here's a couple samples of shorter ones. And again, I have them identified so that you can see them. And when we're done with the, the session, um, just send me an email. We'll, I'll send you the PowerPoint, whoever would like this. Um, but you can see that they can be a little bit shorter for positions that are a little bit further back in your career. Um, but these are in the CCAR format. So you know, demonstrated high political sensitivity in responding effectively and diplomatically to repeated inquiries from the Appropriations Subcommittee during two years about the scope, status, benefits, et cetera, of 15 individual initiatives relative to the department. You know, help define success benchmarks for the department regarding the participation in e-government. Now, what you have to remember is this came off of this person's resume. So the context was in the person's quote unquote duty description. Okay, so now what we have here is just short bullets that describe what this person is doing as 
many accomplishments. And then, like I said, this one, if we, uh, excuse me, if we back up, you can see that some of them are a little bit longer, led the reinvention of the organi organization's expanding IT operations to meet high-level congressional demand, and then we get down to the end, identified and documented requirements for secure com compartment information facilities to serve 4,000 users. And then we talk about you know, transforming the program and introducing completely new procedures and policies for procuring requesting services. So you can see that there's a lot of information packed into a very short space. But this was a big leading change story for this person. And by the way, all the bullets that we use on these slides are for people who have um, been interviewed and selected for, for SES level positions. So We kind of looked at this a little bit when Catherine was online a few minutes ago. The application procedures include USA Jobs, AVU, or even agency specific. You know, if you're applying for DIA or DEA or NSA or, um, oh, I'm trying to think, um, Partnership for Peace might be over on AVU. Uh, Federal Reserve Board would be on their own, their own organization site. So there's different sites that you need to take a look at that might be specific that you have to apply there. And then there's others that you're going to apply through these main um, job boards. Sometimes you might have to turn in a hard copy application, and sometimes um, you're going to upload it to USA Jobs or the agency specific. So again, like we talked about, just really review those announcements thoroughly before you get started. And here is what you would see for a traditional application, and that's kind of what Catherine was looking at. This is one that I pulled down, and it specifically said application includes resume five ECQs, three TQs at 8,000 characters per essay. And then you might see another one that says, any information in excess of five pages will not be considered. And it says up here that you should not address the ECQs or TQs separately. So, and then here's the third format, which is the accomplishments record. I don't see this very often, but I do see it once in a while. And basically what they ask you to do is submit written statements describing accomplishments reflecting capability in the five competencies related to the ECQs. And the competencies that they added were strategic thinking, team building, accountability, human capital, and influencing negotiating. So for example, if you know that um, business acumen is human capital, finance, and technology management, and now all of a sudden you only have to write a one-page essay regarding just human capital, then you want to go back to your business acumen essay and pull out the story or the section just on human capital and then write that up for the accomplishments record. So like I said, I don't see those very often, but they, they are starting to, you know, once in a while. Lessons learned from QRB letters. And if you look in the, in the book on page 127, we have a really nice chapter written up on just specifically what the QRB has said about you know, applicants who've been disapproved. And it's written up very nice, and there's a lot of good examples in there. But this is boiling it down. Didn't describe what the individual did to personally achieve the results. So you're giving too much credit to everybody else. Emphasis on technical rather than leadership skills. Remember, you have technical qualifications, and then you have your executive core qualifications. The QRB is looking for the leadership. Emphasis on process rather than results. That's too many actions and not enough results. And that's what I said earlier. A lot of times people will just say, the result was we improved morale. You've got two pages of essay, and the bottom line says we improved morale. No, you need to have a quarter page that describes how that morale was improved and how that impacted the entire organization. Didn't use the C-car type model. I see that in the comments from them all the time. No, uh, did not use C-car type model, did not see results, or didn't see actions, or you know they identified a piece of it. You, you don't want to say, you don't want your model to actually look like what we showed you on the slide, where it says challenge colon, um, context colon. But you can say, I was challenged, or the results of this action included. So that kind of gives the reader a flow, and they know what's happening next. No evidence of leveraging diversity. And this is really important, and you have to remember that diversity comes from a wide spectrum. So it can be working with military, with contractors, and um, federal personnel, or maybe even foreign personnel. Diversity can be having uh, handicapped or Schedule A people in your office. Diversity can be 
uh, people that you're working with in your office who are PhDs and all the way down to new interns. So di diversity needs to be identified. Let's see if I can click on the next one. No evidence of strategic thinking or vision, and I see this with leading change all the time. You have to identify the strategic thinking and vision. And sometimes people will say to me, well, it wasn't my idea. It came from higher up, and I had to implement it. <clears throat> OK, but you had to implement your vision of what they wanted you to do. So number seven is vague statements or philosophy rather than facts. Again, you have to state what you accomplished, not what you think you would accomplish, or what you would like to, or I believe, or my opinion is. They don't want to hear things like that. No evidence of innovation or creativity. So you have to really be creative and innovative these days. Laundry list of actions without context or results. We'll see that a lot. I did this, 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 and this, and this. Okay, And then no measurable results. And we talked a lot about that. So Catherine, do yes, you have any final comments? Or do we have any questions from anybody in the audience? Well, um, I think in terms of uh, final comments, the um, here at the Resume Place, sometimes we are requested to rewrite ECQs. Um, a person might apply for an SES position, and the OPM will write back their letter saying um, why uh, you are not going to pass the QRB the first time. And that list that Diane just read of those 10 reasons we see written out in, in all great detail by OPM. And it's really true that uh, people just write about philosophy philosophy instead of examples, and, and they don't uh, demonstrate uh, strategic thinking or vision, and clearly that's what they're looking for in government today for SES as strategic thinkers and people who can um, implement change and lead people. So I think the five ECQs are excellent uh, for presenting your executive background, and, um, but the package has to be just right as the PowerPoints have presented here. Our book, the um, new SES application, has samples of the five-page um, SES resume as well as samples of the ECQs written in the CCAR. So it's a, it's a very uh, complicated game to play. And the application is anywhere from, um, oh, is it, uh, I guess six pages to 23 pages. So um, Diane, I, I think you did a great job of presenting the step-by-step -step process of writing the SES application. Um, Diane, what were your objectives in teaching this webinar today? Well, the objectives were to provide an overview of the SES. OK. And uh, in addition to the overview for the SES application, what other uh, objectives did you have? We're having trouble hearing her. Um, we, I know that in our book, our objectives are to teach the five-page SES resume and to teach the um, traditional uh, ECQs and emphasizing the CCAR format, because that is mandatory to cover uh, the context, challenge, action, and results. And then with our webinar to explain how uh, the step-by-step -step process works for your SES application. So um, are you there, Diane? She's, I, I'm not able to hear her right now, but I think that uh, we're all finished with our webinar. I appreciate your attending today. Uh, if you have any questions that you would like to write back to Diane or to me, uh, you have my email address, and uh, we will be preparing a, a recording of this webinar that we will send to Deepak and to Lex. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for attending. I hope that uh, you'll come to another webinar. I'll be teaching another one myself in around 30 minutes on USA Jobs 3.0. Thanks very much. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Bye-bye.